Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on Christian education. This is lesson number 12 in that series on Sabbath, it's experiencing and living the character of God. It's the lesson for December 19 of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we once again gather in your presence, recognizing our desperate need for your guidance and direction in everything we do and say, and especially for this time we are representing you before the world. May we do so in an appropriate way as we read the materials, may we speak them clearly and distinctly, and may we come to be more like you as we study your word as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jim, you have a story for us, huh? Uh, yes. Um, Jody was the only Seventh-day Adventist in her graduate, uh, graduate program, and her choice was not to attend some social events on Sabbath made her beliefs very visible. One day, one of her friends, Gail, called her. Gail's husband was going to be out of town for six weeks, and he asked jo Jody if she wanted to spend the next six Friday nights with her because she knew Jody did nothing on those evenings anyway. <laughs> okay. For the next four Friday nights, they ate together, played music, and shared their Christian experiences, and generally enjoyed each other's company. The fifth weekend, Gail told Jody that she had been downtown shopping and looked at her watch. Oh, good. But this very soon. She suddenly realized that over the four Friday nights she had experienced something new in her Christian experience. She had grown, learned more of God, and deepened her faith. Sabbath had been an opportunity for education and personal development. Okay, what opportunities might we have to get together with acquaintances or friends and enjoy the Sabbath as Jody and her friend did? Why do you suppose God gives two separate... Now, let's go back and talk about the history of the Sabbath. Why do you suppose God gives two separate creation accounts, let's call them? Clearly, Genesis 1 focuses on God's power and his ability to create out of nothing. Genesis 2 focuses on what happened on the sixth day with the creation of Adam and then Eve and the immediate events connected with those experiences. But even those two chapters taken together are nothing but the briefest possible account of what actually happened. Do, do you look forward to the day when we'll see the panorama showing exactly how all those things happened? If you haven't read that passage recently, look at Great Controversy, page 666 and following, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Have you ever tried to imagine yourself in the shoes of Adam and Eve? and or Eve. What were they doing during those first full 24 hours, which, which we will call the first Sabbath? What did they do to get to know each other better? Maybe they're watching their watch. Yeah, right. <laughs> what did they do to explore their garden and the animals that lived there? Think of the incredible variety of shapes and colors and behaviors that must have excited them on that first day. Did they spend that day with Jesus and or some of the angels? What do you think the rest of the universe was doing during their first Sabbath on this earth? Don't you suppose their attention was focused on what Adam and Eve would do with their new world? Carrie? Yeah. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. They were to live in close, pardon me, close, I got that right, communion is what's tricky, with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power, upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives, and that came from Review and Herald, February 11, 1902. Right. It must have been hard to sleep at the end of that first day. At least I sort of think it would, be, it would have been. Did God prepare a special place in the garden for them to sleep? You ever asked yourself that question? What do you think got, mo got the most attention from Adam and Eve on that first day? 
Did they get any guidance from God as to what to look for or what to do? Given what you know now about creation, what things do you think might have excited or surprised them the most? Remember that everything uh, they had counted was brand new. Don't you think Adam and Eve were fascinated by all the different kinds of animals that God had created? What about the trees and flowers? Did they damage anything in the garden by wanting to touch it and, or handle it? I mean, you know, little kids, to see a beautiful flower, you want to, you want to, I've seen little children look at a beautiful flower and they just, yeah. they just squeeze it and of course that spoils the flower. Did they damage anything in the garden by wanting to touch it or handle it? How did they know what was edible and what was not? You ever wondered about that? Did they walk around with any of the angels, even perhaps with God himself? Advance toward, forward about to about 1450 BC. Moses was about to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. They had lost much of their knowledge about God by being kept in slavery for more than 100 years. Now some are going to say, whoa, hold on a minute, I thought they were in slavery for 400 years. No, 400 years is, is counted from the time of Abraham to the time they got out of the, uh, slavery in Egypt. So about half of that was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, before they even got to the land of Canaan, uh, the land of Egypt. The time they spent in Egypt was about 200 years, and about half, the first half of that, of course, they had a, a very privileged position because of Joseph. But then in the second half, because of their incredible reproductive capacity and other things like that, the Egyptians got worried about them and forced them into slavery. So it was about 100 years that they were in slavery. Uh, just a quick question. Was yeah. it 430 years? Or well, it depends on where you start with Abraham's life. Okay. If you start from the time he was called back in, in, in um, Urfa, or Ur, or whether you start from the time he's down in... in it's, yeah, it's, it's easy to work that out. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> so they had lost much of their knowledge about God by being kept in slavery for more than 100 years. They needed to rediscover many things about God and what he wanted from them. God needed to instruct them about keeping the Sabbath and having a special day, one-seventh of their time, to focus their attention on him. You probably know the story found in Exodus 14, I'm sorry, 16, 14 to 29, the story of the manna. What were the Israelites supposed to learn from the experience with the manna? Scholars have always had fun with that manna. You know, in, in Hebrew, manna means, what is it? <laughs> so, what are we having for breakfast? What is it? <laughs> well, how many of the surrounding nations heard about that experience? How much contact did the Israelites have with those other nations? I mean, the other nations around must have wondered, here are these probably a couple million people wandering through the desert, what are they eating? Now, we need to remember that they did have animals, so there probably was milk. I presume that the animals were able to make use of the water that came out of the rock just like the people did. So they got water from there. Did the animals eat manna? We don't know what the animals ate. They didn't talk about it. Well, this experience recorded in Exodus 16 gives us some very specific details. In fact, Notice, first of all, that this is four chapters before Exodus 20. And what happens in Exodus 20? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given at the foot of Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, almost a year, well, a good several months before that. So what should they have learned about God from the manna experience? Friday. First, go ahead. I was going to say Friday, they got a double lot. There was no yes. more on Sabbath. Yep. So, um, first of all, it was a miracle that the food should appear at all, and it appeared every morning, except on Sabbath mornings. On Friday mornings, there was a double portion available. If they tried to keep the manna overnight, on any other day, it spoiled and got rotten. But the extra manna collected on Friday was perfectly good to eat the next day. I mean, there is no way to explain that except a miracle. You, you, there's, there's no other explanation for that kind of thing. What do you think it looked like, or would take well, like, like a, a flower? A tiny, a no, it says it, it's a tiny little flake, so probably a tiny little cracker or something like that. 
that they could make flour out of for the bread and, yeah. and what have you. Yeah. Or like uh, a rice. Yeah. How much time do you think the children of Israel spent gathering manna each morning? Did the children also go out and gather? One would hope so. Yeah. Depend on the size of the family, wouldn't it? Well, suppose you were told, okay, here's a special new food for you. Well, it looks pretty good. We'll try it. You get to eat this as your primary diet for the next 40 years. You know, we are really spoiled. It's probably an early vision, a version of cornflakes. I, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I, our, my family is just, God goes berserk over fruit. There are times we have five or six or seven, maybe eight different kinds of fruit for breakfast. Uh, but anyway, um, so the question is, did preparing this manna in different ways give it a different flavor, a different taste? I think so, yes. I would think so. Right. And it was, it had to be balanced, enough protein, mm. enough fat, enough carbohydrate. Enough. But did they ever mix it with milk and do anything with it that way? Probably. Probably. Well, look at verses, Exodus 16 still, verses 32 to 36. I'm just going to read those. Moses said, The Lord has commanded us to save some manna to be kept for our descendants so that they can see the food which he gave us to eat in the desert when he brought us out of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar, put two liters of manna, or that'd be two quarts of manna, into it, in it, and place it in the Lord's presence to be kept for our descendants. So, where is that place where they're supposed to... I mean, where is the place where it was kept? In the right in the ark. In the most okay. holy place, at yes. least. Even yes. if it wasn't in the ark, at least it was in the most holy place. I mean, we don't know. whether It seems to say right in the ark. Maybe so. So, which one of the children of Israel is going to get a chance to see that? Or even, for sure not, taste it? Only the, most, only the high priest. Only the high priest is ever the one who goes in there. Well, and it never spoiled. Yeah. The question is, if we ever, if we should find the ark today, would that bottle of manna still be good? Mm. I don't know. I was thinking about, you mentioned milk. We don't know whether they had any of the bovine species. Chances are they had sheep and goats. You can mm. milk those. They use it even today. You yeah. buy it off a supermarket shelf. But they, they talk about sacrificing calves. I guess that's true. Oh, that well, sounds like a cow. Yeah, you're right there, but <laughs> were they moving all the time? I mean, they had to breed the things. There's yeah. quite a whole rigmarole there. Yeah. I mean, would you like to lead two million people? Uh, how about two people? No, no. no I mean, uh, well, quite a task. I've been boss of quite a well, few people in my day. That doesn't bother me. Let's, let's talk about some obvious things. There were no churches along the way for them to stop and worship. Yeah. For sure. So what were their Sabbaths like? What do you think? Did Moses ever call them all together? And if so, how would you address a couple million people? How would you address a couple million people? <clears throat> Moses did speak to the children. He did. We don't know exactly how he did it, but well, he did it. Ellen White also spoke to quite large crowds. 5,000. Know, That's a lot. That's a lot. Roman. A little bit short of 2 million. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. most were illiterate, there would have been a leader or someone yeah. that would relay the the a story or a lesson or a concept. That would, that's the other question. Did he have people scattered out so he would speak fairly loud and someone over here and someone over there is repeating and someone beyond them was repeating? That's possible, but that really slows down the, uh, the whole process. Um, I remember a funny story that my major professor from college told me. He grew up in Canada and he had learned to speak French and English, of course, and um, so he'd been working with an English church, and this other church invited him to come over there and make a presentation. To, to, I think it was a Wednesday night prayer meeting. And he figured it would be half an hour and something like that. So he got it all prepared himself, and he arrived over there, and they said, oh, you know, this is a mixed English-French congregation, so you will have a translator. <laughs> it, it, it scared him so bad that 
the whole thing, the whole ceremony, translation and all, took seven minutes. <laughs> so he, he, just, he just blew his, you know, he, he figured he would fill in and all this kind of stuff, but he was so worried about the translator. So um, anyway, talking about your people scattered out there talking about. <laughs> well, as far as we know, except when they were moving, the people of Israel apparently did, ha did not have any special work to do except now, that's not true at the foot of Mount Sinai, because what did he do at the foot of Mount Sinai? For almost a year? Camped out there, didn't they? They camped, okay. and what were they doing while they were camping? Learning to behave themselves. Well, some of that too, but that's not the real job God gave them. That's where they built the tabernacle. Oh, yes, yes. They spent almost a year building yes. the tabernacle, putting it all together. So very definite design. Yeah. Well, the people of Israel apparently didn't know how to any, have any special work to do except prepare food, which mana, the manna, or manna, was provided for them. They needed to care for their animals, whatever animals they had. They needed to care for their tents and educate their children. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much what they had to do. You know, uh, we're talking about pre uh, building the temple, uh, not the temple, but the tabernacle. tabernacle. Yeah, he comes down from the mountain, and these guys are worshiping a calf. All right, so he gets mad, and we know the story. And then he says, now, well, uh, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them after the pattern that I show you. And look at the response of these people. Yeah. Till he says, stop, that's enough. Enough of gold, enough of yeah. silver, enough. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of extreme people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very extreme. You, uh, I hope they weren't so generous because they were afraid. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a typical pagan response would it be, you know, yeah. you could do something for your God. So. Well, suppose you were dealing with a teenager in our day who's used to social media and television, and suppose he found the Sabbath boring. What could you do to make the Sabbath more meaningful? Well, in, in our day and age, like for here example, you can get 3ABN if you want it. Yeah. And you can contact back east and you can get, what is it, that Pastor Bradshaw that does a very good sermon. I bought a whole kit of that stuff. Yeah. Just, just to fill in for those kind of things. Yeah, well, uh, it, Sabbath should be a time to get together with your friends. Yeah. But and also, we, I don't think we've mentioned it, when they're young, you teach them the certain things you can and can. we don't really agree with doing and if you don't teach them they're going to be a problem further down the road. Yep. It could be a chance to explore nature. That's one of the favorite yes. things we did when I was young. Uh, we would go and my brother and I had quite a collection of butterflies and bugs and so forth we caught. We had them all preserved in these. In those days you could go almost anywhere and pick up cigar boxes. So we would put a little piece of a pegboard sort of at the bottom of a cigar box and you could uh, stick these these bugs in there. So well, Isaiah 58, if you call the Sabbath, Sabbath a delight, mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful, you know, and, and yes, you had delightful experience. Yep. Where I was and, raised, we used to, and, and in winter and spring, we used to go looking for wild orchids. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few around if you knew where to look. Yeah. I still could take you there and show it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it could be, now here's a wild radical thought, it could be a chance to spend some quality time with mom and dad. Yeah. Yes. What about that? We know that the children of Israel had a lot of ups and downs in their religious experience. Near the end of their time and facing Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah wrote these words. Charles? In Jeremiah 17, 19 to 27, the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, go and announce my people at the people's gate. My message. Message at the people's gate through which the kings of Judah enter and leave the city. Then go to all the other gates of Jerusalem. Tell the kings and all the people of Judah and everyone who lives in Jerusalem and enters these gates to listen to what I say. Tell them that if they love their lives, they must not carry any load in this on the Sabbath. Now, uh, let me let me just 
make an interesting point on that. The um, Jewish Mishnah makes a huge deal about this carrying nothing carrying in and nothing carry out. The rules they have about that are just beyond belief. Um, but here's here's where they get it from. It's we we have to admit it's the God said. And why would he say nothing carry in and nothing carry out? Why would he say that? Visiting merchants coming and going. Exactly. This was the way you 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 brought in your goods to sell and yep. you took out to this and that and the other. So you, you, you had to go through a fairly fa big old heavy duty, sometimes three levels of gates to get out. This isn't a time you're not you're not going to the church or something like that. You're on business. And he, he, that's what he's saying here. No business. Well, uh, they never learned. Uh, yes, we yeah. know about this, that the merchants would come and sell stuff. And then during the Lord's time, mm -hmm. he went and threw those guys out of, get out of here yeah. in my father's house. Don't in the in temple the, courtyard. In the temple courtyard. So. Yeah. Okay, oh, Charles. Not, yes. Uh, what, what, they must not carry anything in through the gates of Jerusalem or carry anything out of their houses on the Sabbath. They must not work on the Sabbath. They must observe it as a sacred day as I commanded their ancestors. Let me interrupt once more. So they, they got very very technical about this command. You can't take carry anything out and you can't carry anything out, but what if you're standing outside, can you reach inside and grab something and bring it out? No, that's carrying something out. Or can you reach out and hand something to somebody outside? No, that doesn't count either. Or even Talmud, I guess, you know, you cannot walk more than half a mile. Right. Sabbath days walk, you yeah. know, I mean, the, yeah. But the Lord says if you call the Sabbath, but, like, but if you go out there at that distance and you put a lunch under a rock, <laughs> that's a second home. So now you go that far, take a couple <laughs> bites, and then you can do it the next. <laughs> but they would have looked after their livestock, wouldn't they? Yeah, to some. To a certain extent, you'd have to. But Jesus says if, yeah, yeah. if your animal falls in a pit, you're going to go you take him out. I mean, you take him out to give him water, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Their ancestors did not listen to me or pay any attention. Instead, they became stubborn. They would not obey me or learn from me. Tell these people that they must obey all my commands. They must not carry any load through the gates of this city on Sabbath. They must observe the Sabbath as a sacred day and must not do any work at all. Then their kings and princes will enter the gates of, the, of Jerusalem and have the same loyal power that David had. Together with the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they will ride in chariots and on horses and the city of Jerusalem will always be filled with people. People will come from towns of Judah and from the villages around Jerusalem. They will come from the territory of Benjamin and from the foothills, from the mountains and from the southern Ju from southern Judah, they will bring to my temple burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and incenses, and as well as thank offerings. But they must obey me and observe the Sabbath as a sacred day. They must not carry any load through the gates of Jerusalem on that day. For if they do, I will set the gates of Jerusalem on fire. Fire will burn down the palaces of Jerusalem, and no one will be able to put it out. American Bible Society. And that's exactly what happened, wasn't it? Yes. Clearly, things were in a pretty bad condition in Jeremiah's day. God felt that he had to give them very stern and strict guidelines, which, as we now know, they still did not follow. More than a hundred years earlier, Isaiah was given a message as well. Diana? Isaiah 58, 1 to 16. The Lord says, shout as loud as you can. Tell my people Israel about their sins. They worship me every day, claiming that they are eager to know my ways and obey my laws. They say they want to give them, give me to they say they want me to give them just laws and that they take pleasure in worshiping me. The people ask, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? Why should we go without food if he pays no attention? 
The Lord says to them, the truth is that of the same time as you fast, you pursue your own interests and oppress your workers. Your fasting makes you violent and you quarrel and fight. Do you think this kind of fasting will make me listen to your prayers? When you fast, you make yourself suffer. You bow your heads low like a blade of grass and spread out sackcloth and ashes to lie on. Is that what you call fasting? Do you think I will be pleased with that? The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who are nothing, have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. Then my favor will shine on you like the morning sun and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call me, I will respond. If you put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt and to every evil word, if you give food to the hungry and satisfy those who are in need, then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of noon, and I will always guide you and satisfy you with good things. I will keep you strong and well. You will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring of water that never runs dry. Your people will rebuild what has long been in ruins, building again on the old foundations. You will be known as the people who rebuild the walls, who restored the ruined houses. The Lord says, if you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interests on that day, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idly on that day, then you will find the joy that comes from serving me. I will make you honored all over the world, and you will enjoy the land I give to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. That's a magnificent uh, passage, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really explains it's, it's, the difference between simple. the legalism and the spirit of the yeah. law. It's Amen. simple. It it's simple, to, easy to understand. You don't need to have big, thick books. To, I mean, it's just uh, very direct and to the point. Yeah. Well, what would God say about our churches or our Sabbath school classes today? Would either of these experiences recorded about Judah be close to what God might say now? Well, Sabbath was never intended by God to be a ritual experience. With little change from week to week, just boom, 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 the same thing every Sabbath. What would happen if a Seventh-day Adventist church, or even a Sabbath school class, chose to make Isaiah 58, 13, and 14 their guidance for observing the Sabbath for a period of time? I uh, tempted to think back uh, uh, of uh, uh, Graham Maxwell. Mm -hmm. He says, what we do is really an expression of the kind of picture we have of our Heavenly Father, which yep. is so very true, even yep. keeping on the Sabbath. Yep, exactly. Well, remember the book uh, by Abraham Joshua Heschel, the, well, The Sabbath, and they look forward from the beginning of the week to the Queen Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's it, 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 it just... Uh, Waiting for the Queen to come. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what he called it. What, what would it mean to delight in the Sabbath? If we do not delight in the Sabbath, what can we do to change that fact? Well, there are some who feel like we should do something fairly radical, like fasting and praying occasionally on the Sabbath day. But what does it mean to fast and pray? Now and onward, and I'm quoting from Ellen White, now and onward, to the close of the time, the people of God should be wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but wholly in the wisdom of their, their leader. They should set aside days for fasting and prayer. Entire abstinence from food should not be required, but they should deny themselves the food they usually enjoy and partake of a plain, simple diet. No one should lift up his soul unto vanity, walking in self-indulgence and pride, for this is a time that demands genuine humiliation and most earnest prayer. We are nearing the most important crisis that has ever come upon the world. If we are not wide awake and watching, it will steal upon us as a thief. 
Satan is preparing to work through his human agencies in secrecy. Manuscript releases, volume 13, page 330, paragraph 2. Wow. Satan is preparing to work through his human agencies in what? Secrecy. Yeah. Secrecy. Hmm. <laughs> How's that going to work? Well, the experiences of Jesus in which he confronted the Jewish religious leaders over the keeping of the Sabbath are quite remarkable. I mean, there are so many of them. I just think of, of uh, um, the book of John, chapter 5 and chapter 8 and chapter uh, 9, and, you know, it just almost goes on and on and on. What do we know about Jewish synagogues in the days of Jesus? Now we need to remember there's a distinction between the temple in Jerusalem where you came and offered a sacrifice and so forth and the synagogues. What were the synagogues? Assembly places. Those are places for people to come together on the Sabbath to worship God. Uh, the rule said that if you had at least 10 Jewish families in a community, they had to have a synagogue. And it has been estimated that in and around Jerusalem there were 200 synagogues. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who did that estimate, but I can, it wasn't me. I mean, I... <laughs> so they were small gathering places yeah. to yeah. study? Yep. And, and worship on Sabbath. Yep. Well, normally someone would read a passage of Scripture while standing up in front. They would normally stand up first. Of course, there's a big scroll, and you read it out like this, and you roll it up on that side, and roll it out on this side, and you read the passage. Um, then he would sit down while he explained what he had learned or what the people should have learned from that passage. It turns out that even in his younger days, Jesus was very good at doing that. Jim? Thus, as he grew in wisdom and stature, Jesus increased in favor with God and man. He drew the sympathy of all hearts by showing himself capable of sympathizing with all. The atmos atmosphere of hope and courage was surrounded, excuse me, that surrounded him made him a blessing in every home and often in the synagogue on the Sabbath day he was called upon to read the lessons from the prophets and the hearts of all the hearers thrilled as a new light shone from the familiar words of the sacred text. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 74. Wow. Can you imagine the difference between listening to Jesus even as a 12-year-old, getting up and reading and his insight, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the regular in, person that got up in, in, and read. Yeah. You know, can you imagine yeah. what well, was and, going and, on? And in that context, I was just thinking of that same idea. You were not supposed to do that unless you were at least 30. But they recognized that this young man was so different that they set aside the rules. Yeah. Said, Cobb, you, you, you read this for us and tell us what you think. And Amazing. the passage that put him into trouble right in his own home. Yeah. It's today these words have come fulfilled. fulfilled. Yeah. And it's, it's yes. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it wouldn't be so much the reading of it as the insight that yeah. he had, oh, how he would explain it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it's almost unbelievable unfathomable <laughs> th what that must have been like. You wish he could have said, by the way, these are the words I spoke to the yes. prophet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, I'm sure he didn't say that. But, 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 but that day is coming that yeah. we will hear him. That's right. We will hear yeah, it. We will hear we it. We will hear it. Is. Again and again. It's never going to be boring throughout we will. eternity. But when we see the panorama, and I'm sure we're going to watch it many times, yes. we will see it in 3D living color, it'll make Steven Spielberg turn green, as I usually say. I mean, God is not going to, you know, it's going to be 3D living color just as it happened. There it is, you know. Mm -hmm. But as Jesus shined a new light on many of the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees, many people came to think that maybe he was doing away with the teachings of the Old Testament. His response was always as follows. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law 
will be done away with not until the end of all things. That's from the Good News Bible. Wow. Consider some of the experiences in which Jesus interacted with the religious leaders over their observance of the Sabbath. Um, and we're, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Matthew 12, 1 to 13, and Luke 13, 10 to 17. If you get a chance to read them, we'll just talk about them for a moment. In these verses, we have three brief stories about events that took place on the Sabbath. One, the time when his disciples, traveling with Jesus, harvested grain and ate it on a Sabbath afternoon. Okay, that was wheat or oats, and they rubbed it in their hands, <laughs> blew away the chaff, and ate the grains. Well, two, the time when a man with a paralyzed hand was healed by Jesus on the Sabbath. And he didn't, he didn't say heal, he just said, stretch out your hand. That was breaking the Sabbath, you see. Well, no, he didn't break the, he just told the man to stick his hand out. Right, but <laughs> his name they, is... They accused oh, him of breaking right, the right. Sabbath. What was amazing, it is important to notice that Matthew 12, 14, the next verse says, then the Pharisees left and made plans to kill Jesus mm. because he healed a man on the Sabbath in church. Can you imagine that? How could such a conclusion come from the fact that Jesus was doing good? These events happened fairly early in Jesus' Galilean ministry after he had been baptized in the fall of A.D. 27, spent more than a year working quietly in Judea. So these events took place between the second Passover of his ministry and the spring of 80, in the spring of AD 29, and the third Passover in the spring of AD 30. The third event took place later when Jesus healed a woman in the synagogue on the Sabbath. It is important to notice these words in Luke 13, 17. His answer made his enemies ashamed of themselves while the people rejoiced over all the wonderful things that he did. I mean, imagine, here you're complaining about what Jesus is doing. All the people are doing what? Rejoicing. They're rejoicing. Yeah. <coughs> One is the um, letter of the law. And, and Jesus showed the spirit of the Sabbath, the spirit of the law. It's so beautiful. There was hardly a time when Jesus did anything significant on the Sabbath that did not lead to some kind of conflict with the Jewish leaders. These conflicts gave Jesus an opportunity to speak about some very important truths. And we know that's true. Mark 2.27, he sort of summarizes what he wanted to say about the Sabbath. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man, this human being, in other words, is also Lord of the Sabbath. Imagine saying that to one of the Pharisees. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah, a few bristles come up then. Yeah. So think about it now. It's about what I'm trying to make you th think, and you out there, imagine yourself in the setting. What do you suppose the people talked about going home, uh, talked about after going home from the synagogue on a day when Jesus had performed a miracle there? Would that have been idle talk? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, would it have fit there? the the norm for the day of what what they should be talking about. Yeah. Can you imagine? I can imagine. Did you see his hand? Well, I was looking, oh, here, I saw it from this angle. I saw it from that, you know, and all the different things that happened. They must have been, and I mean, this man that was healed, they must have known him. All of them must have known him before. Did you see so-and-so's hand? Now it works. What did, how did Jesus do that? I will. <laughs> I read another thing from Ellen White this this week that's not directly here, but um, is quite interesting. The, after feeding the five thousand, they followed him over to Capernaum. They wanted breakfast again the next day, and Ellen White says part of the reason they were very the Pharisees, particularly, were really following, hoping he would perform the miracle again, because they thought there must be some trick he had for doing this, and they wanted to figure out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, in our day, is it possible to get so caught up in keeping the rules and regulations, the do's and the don'ts, that we, look, we overlook what God intended for the Sabbath to mean to us? So what can we do to change that? 
Surely Jesus must have regarded his visits to the synagogue on the Sabbath as major teaching opportunities. Luke 4, 16, Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures. And imagine from what we read earlier, the people thought, this is going to be a wonderful thing. Remember how Jesus used to read the scriptures here in, in, the, in, the, in, the, sanct in the synagogue. And they were all excited. And then remember he read that passage from Isaiah and they knew that that passage was messianic. They were mm -hmm. supposed to look forward to the Messiah. And what did Jesus say? This day these, these words are fulfilled, fulfilled. fulfilled. Yeah. Right. in their presence. And then they sat down. <laughs> and all of a sudden they said, hold on! You mean that kid who used to work in the carpenter shop is claiming to be the Messiah? Mm. Hold on! Just to, They took him up on the mountain. We're going to throw him over. Yeah. And another thing I heard, I was listening to audio books of Al, from Alan White this week. I, went, I always wondered what this, you know, he, he escaped through the crowds. She says, their eyes were blinded. That's why they couldn't see him leaving. So that's how God actually did that. He apparently blinded their eyes somehow or other, and Jesus walked out. Well, Paul did much of the same in his ministry. Diana? Acts 13, 16, and 26. Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and began to speak. Fellow Israelites and all Gentiles here who worship God, hear me. My fellow Israelites, descendants of Abraham, and all Gentiles here who worship God, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. From the Good News Bible once again. Seventh-day Adventists have often found themselves in disputes with other Christians over whether we should worship on Saturday or Sunday. We should not let the day on which we worship so consume our attention as to overlook what the Sabbath is supposed to be all about. One of the questions that arises is whether or not the Sabbath was kept by the early apostles. And before we jump into those verses, I remember something I heard one time that really stuck with me. It said, we, sh we shouldn't make such a big deal about Sabbath versus Sunday. Why not? If you convince someone to fully recognize any day, all day long, to worship God and serve Him. Don't watch the football game. Don't do other kinds of things you would normally do on Sunday afternoon. So, it, then it's no problem for, to commit, convince such a person to switch the day from sa Sunday to Saturday. If he, if he really, the, pro, the deal about Sunday is you go, and some of them go Saturday night, so they get it out of the way. Then they can spend all Sunday doing what they want to do. Yeah. See, that's where the problem is. It's not they don't have a big hang-up on Sunday, most people. Uh, the, the thing is, we want, we want to spend most of the time doing what we want to do. So if you can convince them to dedicate a full day, 24 hours, to serving God, then it'll be easy to convince them to take up the Sabbath. Well, look at the following passages. Acts 16, 13 and 14. On the Sabbath we went out of the city, that is Philippi, to the riverside where we thought there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. Apparently they had not been able to find any synagogue there. We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. One of those who heard us was Lydia from Thyatira, who was a dealer in purple cloth. She was a woman who worshipped God and the Lord opened her mind to pay attention to what Paul was saying. So here's a case where they found someone who was interested and willing to worship with them, even though they weren't even, weren't, weren't even Jews. And then Acts 17, 1 to 5. Paul and Silas traveled on through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue. Now they found a synagogue. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. We, we, back in Acts chapter 4, we said, I mean, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, we said, Jesus went to the synagogue in Jerusalem as his custom was, right? Yeah. What's happening here with Paul many years later? According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue. So there's no question about the fact that the, 
the early apostles were worshiping on the seven-day Sabbath. There, during three Sabbaths, he held discussions with the people, quoting and explaining the scriptures and proving from them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. In other words, he's not going to come with a, on a white stallion leading the armies to conquer the Romans. This Jesus, whom I announced to you, Paul said, is the Messiah, the one sent, the one anointed. Some of them were convinced and joined Paul and Silas, so did, so did many of the leading women and a large group of Greeks who worshiped God. Good News Bible. And then elsewhere, Acts 18.4, further on, he held discussions in the synagogue in Corinth every Sabbath, trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. Well, on each of these occasions, it is clear that Paul and his associates made every attempt to worship on the Sabbath, although it was many years after the death of Jesus. But why would they not, why would you think they wouldn't have kept the Sabbath? They were initially Jews. Yeah. All they did was adju adjust their, th their thinking. <laughs> yeah. You know, but they were basically Jews. Yeah. But the, now there's a lot of Gentiles joining in, and they worship on Sabbath too. That's true. And why, why is that an issue? Because many Christians who worship on Sunday want people to believe that the Christians started worshiping on Sunday just soon after resurrection as a celebration of resurrection. Right. So that's, that's what the problem yeah. is. Because the Jewish faith was more organized than anything else. There were yeah. idols, groups of people that worshiped a particular idol, but the Jewish faith collectively was a large yeah. mass of people, very organized. Mm -hmm. Yes. Often Jesus, he, Paul, often Paul was asked to speak in the synagogue. At times when there was no synagogue he could locate in a given city, he would go to a place by a river where the Jews might gather to seek God and pray. So what do you suppose Paul talked about when he was given an opportunity to do so in a synagogue? It has been suggested by some scholars that what Jesus said to the two men walking on the road to Emmaus as recorded in Luke 24, might have served as a sermon outline for the apostles on many occasions thereafter. What did Jesus say to those apostles? Do you remember what, what, what are the words it says there in Luke 4, 24? He really reviewed the history and brought them to the point that Christ was coming. And okay. He, he went through the history. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Let me read the actual words. Um, then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophet said. This is Luke 24, starting with verse 25. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. So Jesus said, just look at, look at the scriptures. Follow it right through. And here's all, you know, everything is just spelled out there. And that's exactly what Paul did again mm -hmm. and again. Mm -hmm. So it's, many people believe that, the, that that information that Jesus, that way Jesus sort of explained things to the, to the, to the disciples basically in the upper room after they got back from Emmaus, uh, Served, stuck in their minds that served a kind of outline. It was so compelling that that was their outline for sermons again and again. The outline would go something like this. One, God guided his people, the Jewish people, for many years through their experiences recorded in the Old Testament. Two, in those Old Testament scriptures, a Messiah was promised. promised. Three, Jesus of Nazareth has come and lived and died. For he fits the criteria for the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. Five, the church is growing rapidly and God is calling both Jews and Gentiles to join his church. Think of the experience of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Do you understand the history of the Adventist church fairly well? In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of, of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. And these are the words of Ellen White. As I see 
What God has brought, I am filled with the astonishment and with confidence in Christ as, a le as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people if we will put our trust in the Lord for we are hand handling the mighty truths of the word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. <clears throat> now there's some people who misread that quotation. Say, Let me just repeat the words that she said there. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we should forget the way the Lord has led us in his teaching in our past history. Does that mean that we always followed his leading? No. No, we didn't. So when we were not following his leading, that were not, those were not good times. The good times were when we were following his leading. So if you look back at some bad times in Adventist history, those are the times when we lost our way. One thing that is obviously distinct in Christianity about, se about Seventh-day Adventism is our keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Through faith they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. When the command was given to Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Lord said also to them, Ye shall be holy men unto me. It was Exodus 28, 22, 31. Only thus could the Sabbath distinguish Israel as the worshippers of God. And the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's powers to make us holy, and it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who through Christ become a part of the Israel of God. That's from Desire of Ages, page 288, Paragraph 2 and 289. Has your experience of the Sabbath enriched your Christian life? What could you do to enable yourself to learn more about God's character in the Sabbath each week? Could you plan a Sabbath potluck for your Sabbath school class, giving it an opportunity to discuss some important issues and so forth? Uh, we're running out of time. How can we use the, our theological understanding from the Bible to attract others to the Gospel? Of the 89 chapters in the four Gospels, 11 of them talk about issues concerning the Sabbath. Mm. These Gospels were not written until at least 30 years after Jesus was dead, resurrected, and gone back to heaven. Would the Gospel writers still have been talking so much about the Sabbath if the Sabbath had been done away with? Often we as Adventists think that we are the only ones who have carefully studied the Sabbath. But that's not true. Notice these words from an exegetical uh, PhD done by a non-Adventist, University of Hamburg, in June of 1975. Charles? Matthew and Luke's genealogies are organized according to a sabbatical sevenfold arrangement or one that is based on multiples of seven. Matthew, for example, offers three, offer three groups of 14 generations in which Abraham, David, and Jesus are the high points. Jesus is the continuation and culmination of the salvation pattern which began in, in Israel. Luke has 77 generations starting right from creation to Jesus. Tying Jesus to creation through genealogy shows that his salvation is for all of humanity, a fundamental truth that the Sabbath symbolizes. Beautiful. The fact that Jesus is Lord of Sabbath, see Matthew 12, 8, means that Sabbath belongs to the Messiah as it belonged to Yahweh of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Sabbath was a sign of the covenant that God had with Israel that they might know that the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath is God, Ezekiel 2020. 20. 
and that he is the one who sacrifices and sanctifies them. Ezekiel 20, 12, Exodus 31, 13. The foreigner who kept the Sabbath also was guaranteed to receive a place and an everlasting name in his house, Isaiah 56, 5, which is to be a house of prayer for all people, Isaiah 56, 7. In this sense, Sabbath is certainly given for the sake of men for his salvation. Jesus reinforces these same points by asking rhetorically whether the Sabbath is a time for saving life, Matthew 3, 4, and freeing the suffering from the bondage, Luke 13, 16. The Sabbath is intimately connected with the salvation in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 5, 15, and is the same with Jesus in the New Testament. Okay, Diana, you've got a moment to cover the rest of this. Just as the temple in the, New, in the Old Testament functioned as a place of forgiveness, release, and salvation, so Jesus being greater than the temple is now the locus of salvation. The salvation that Jesus brings is potently seen in his healings. The word for save, sozo, is often used to refer to physical healing, such as in Matthew 9.22. Mark 6:56, Luke 17:19. Jesus chooses to demonstrate his healing and salvation actions on the Sabbath. You'll find that in Mark 3, verse 4, Luke 13:10, John 5, 1 and 9. Each of these cases and more could have waited till another day besides the Sabbath, but perhaps Jesus intends to show the eminence of the kingdom of God. Luke 4, 16 to 19, and Luke 7, verse 22. And purposefully links the Sabbath with salvation, so that the Sabbath remains the sign of the Masonic, Masonic yes, kingdom, yeah. as quoted in an adult Sabbath teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide. Well, could we as individuals, uh, individual Sabbath school classes, or even small study groups improve our understanding of God's character? Of the meaning of the Sabbath and the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist Church by giving study to it? Have you ever considered doing that in your Sabbath school class or in your church? Think of what a blessing that would bring. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you recognizing your presence with us and thanking you for this lesson, what it teaches us about the Sabbath. May it be a blessing to all those who listen in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.